started, and I'll let Jody introduce herself. Um, I've been working in animal welfare as a volunteer or a shelter employee for about 12 years. My um, my career really started at a, a shelter called Dumb Friends League. It's out in Denver, Colorado. Um, they train their staff in every single part of animal welfare in regards to their programs. So humane education and animal cruelty, in shelter behavior programs, adoption, intake. You do all of it so that you really understand what goes into running a shelter and you can really feel for your co-workers and what they're responsible for and what you're responsible for. Um, I learned a lot through them. Uh, we were very lucky to always have a very high adoption rate. Um, we did intake 75 animals a day on average, so it's roughly 25,000 a year, so a very high volume shelter. To have such a high adoption rate was it's a blessing to learn from them. I feel they're one of the best. So you'll probably hear me refer a lot to the Dumb Friends League. Um, Judy and I will both be at the um, expert roundtables at 3.30, so anything we're not able to get to today or questions we're not able to answer before the next session starts, come see us. We're happy to talk to you. We have business cards. We'll put um, our materials up on the website after the conference so you can get to them there. Um, go ahead and introduce your... Uh, well, my name is Jody Harding, and I am direction or er, Director of Operations. Sorry, I just got the title, so... <laughs> 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 Director of Operations at the Toledo Humane Society. Um, I have been the rescue coordinator for the past two years for the Humane Society. Uh, before I took it over, we were sending anything to rescue, whether it was aggressive, uh, a medical rash. We weren't telling rescue anything about the dogs. Um, so my big focus was being honest with the rescues, making sure they know exactly what they're getting into. Um, decrease our euthanasia rate. Our euthanasia rate was pretty high. Um, right now we're adopting about 76% of our animals. Uh, we intake between four and 5,000 a year. Um, so getting a partner with rescues is um, critical to our euthanasia rate. Um, I am also our foster care coordinator. Um, I put together our foster team, um, and that's definitely key too as well to our euthanasia rates. Um, many of our animals would not be adopted out if we didn't have a foster program. Um, so just working, um, getting those programs is really what I was working on. Um, I started in July 2007 and have been building those programs as I, as I moved along. So. All right. Before we really dive into the very specifics of what we're talking about, I want to share with you guys something that was shared with me 10 years ago. And at the time it was shared with me, I didn't really think a whole lot of it, but now having worked through a shelter, volunteered at many area shelters here in Michigan, and then started Pause for Life in um, 2007, I now see the wisdom and value in it. Um, it, I call it organizational poison. It, it's really um, something, it's a philosophy, if you internalize it, amongst yourself, amongst you and your coworkers, other volunteers, between you and other rescues, you and other shelters, it will kill you. It's like a cancer and it will spread. Um, we're not in competition with each other. Shelters, rescues, 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 we should all be working together. We've got one, the same goal. We may not get to it doing it the exact same way, but in the end, we shouldn't be in competition with each other. Pet stores and puppy mills, the whole other story. That's my competition. That's who I want to put out of business. End of game, I want to put myself out of business, but you know, it's a long way to go. So the executive director of Dumb Friends League started every all staff meeting with this phrase. It was his biggest pet peeve, his biggest annoyance, and now I see why. It's that philosophy of I care more than you care. And maybe you do, but thinking that and acting it out will cause problems. If there's any way you can you can stifle it, swallow it, don't be in competition with that person, this won't enter your mind. And I'm telling you, the time he first time he said it to me, I went, yeah, well, I do. So I, you know. <laughs> over time, I see what that does. You can't do it. Just because another rescue or shelter or volunteer within your own organization goes about something differently or has a different way of looking at it, it doesn't mean you care more than they do or that they care less than you do. Maybe they don't have the same degree of education you do or the same level of experience. So I only bring that up because... I am very grateful that he said that to me that long ago because it really has helped me now. So that's just a little thing. So um, you should have some evaluation forms and ask us to make sure you guys fill those out and turn those in. Um, see us at the 330 round table. Or maybe they're going to give them to you. 
I don't have them. Nothing? Okay. Nothing. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that, uh, but leave us feedback. We want to know. We want to make this conference an annual thing, and we want to improve upon it, and we want to get to this goal. As a state, I think we can do it. And I'll tell you the other thing. I'm a convert. I came from an open admission shelter. Euthanasia was part of it. I was taught from the very beginning. It, it's unfortunately a necessary evil. It has to be there. We can't do it without euthanasia as a part of this. And, and getting involved in this and starting to read and be educated, I've got a different perspective on it. And um, a lot of what Debbie said this morning in the breakfast and everything really rings true. So even if you've come from the same spot of no kill is the third rail, it's a lightning bolt, it is controversial, it divides people. I think as we look at things differently and um, work together more, I, I think we can get there. So I have a different perspective than I, than I did for quite some time. So why do we partner? Everybody's got to. I, I don't care if you're the smallest rescue, the largest, the biggest shelter, we can, it doesn't matter. You've got to have people to work with. If you're out there on an island, you're going to start to spin in circles, feel like you're drowning, the overwhelming feeling comes over. So work together. Um, types of partnerships. So um, Shelter to Rescue, Pause for Life started because I wanted to start pulling the overflow from shelters. Dogs and cats being euthanized for time and space. They, they did nothing wrong, they're perfectly healthy, perfectly adaptable, no behavior problems. Um, but yet they're losing their life simply because they sat for two weeks, six weeks, whatever the time limit is. So that's why we started. And I, I wanted to answer Debbie's question in breakfast too, where she said she, you know, tried to help somebody get a pet and all these rescues and never got a phone call back. I would love for someone to carry my phone for a day. <laughs> when you have 56 shelters calling you every day for their over, you can't pull from all of them. It's just not humanly possible. Picking and choosing and having to say no will wear on you, it will wear you down. So to help us with that fatigue, we set up a protocol. These are the shelters we pull from. We have reasons why we pull from them and we have agreements with them and it's a mutually beneficial relationship. The shelter needs help with these dogs. They know us because we have started a partnership. They know whether or not we can handle it, whether or not we have the resources. A lot of times we just you know, gotta ask where we are and how full we are. Um, but knowing that these are the three shelters we pull from, makes it a little easier on us. We know how those shelters operate and they know how we operate. So we're gonna talk about how you start that partnership and, and who, and a lot of it has to do with your resources. What is your organization here to do? Are you here to pull overflow? Are you here to, you know, you've got a lot of volunteers who have behavior experience. We want those challenges. Send us the ones that have behavior problems that the shelters don't have resources to work with. If that's what you're here for, find the shelter that needs that. So partnering is really looking for mutually beneficial relationships, what they need and what we need and finding a way to work together. We pull from Toledo Humane, they send us animals who are, um, and, they, and we mainly do dogs in Toledo. Um, they are fully vetted, they come with their temperament test. I know exactly what I'm getting. Um, they also help with transporting. If I don't have a driver who can go down and pick up the dog, I know Toledo's gonna work with me. Whether we meet halfway, they bring her all the way up. That relationship allows us to pull from a very uh, high, high kill, for that lack of a better word, high turnover, rural shelter group who never gets adoption. People just don't go there. It's out in the middle of nowhere. They're county animal control, way up north. And so they've got great animals. It's just they don't have any population. They don't have public to really come in and adapt. Those dogs don't come to me fully vetted. So I don't have the expense with Toledo's dogs. It allows me to help that shelter knowing I'm gonna have to vet every single one that comes in. In a lot of cases, they're not gonna be kept tested either. And then we also work with an animal control, a very local animal control, and really for the same reason, they don't get a lot of the public coming in to adapt. Um, they have a lot of really great, um, great animals, so we pull from them. So we balance it out. One thing too, um, since we have partnership with Courtney and a couple other rescues, um, we have gotten to where 100% of our adoptable dogs that walk through our door are going somewhere. They're not in our freezer. They're not um, sitting in a cage for a year. Um, they get out um, into either rescue, good foster homes, or they're adopted out um, because we have been able to make partnerships with Courtney on the rescue. Yeah. And shelter to shelter partnerships work too. When I worked at the Dumb Friends League, Denver had passed the BSL, specific legislation. We could not adopt out pit bulls anymore. 
it wasn't an option to just put them down because we could breed. We were seeing great dogs. So we worked with a shelter about 30 miles north of Denver who did not have BSL. And they would send us their dogs who'd just been sitting, an older black lab that just, you know, isn't getting attention, it's older. Or a litter of puppies that they just don't have foster care for and they don't want them growing up in the shelter. We train. They take our pit bulls and pit bull mixes, send down whatever it was that really needed some extra help. Um, and, and that worked. And those dogs got adopted from up there where it was legal. We were able to take an animal. We had space for it. Why not? Um, so shelter partnerships, those can work too. Um, you, again, look at your needs and what their needs are. Um, another example I've seen once, and I wasn't involved in it, but there's an area, there was an area of Colorado that had nothing but black labs. 75% black labs, black labs, black labs. So they worked with the shelter on the other side of the state. They had a lot of chows and a lot of other, just a lot of other breeds, and they trade. You know, they work with each other, they knew each other, they agreed with one another's policies or how they function, and so they get volunteer drivers to take five black labs over here and bring back kind of a mix of something else or whatever volume they could handle. But those kind of partnerships can help as well. You've got to know who you're working with, and you got to be okay with what they do. Um, let's see. So, and um, another way that rescues can help you are with, um, you don't have foster care, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute, how to start a great program, because they are incredibly beneficial. But you have animals that need to be quarantined, and you've run out of space, and you don't have fosters. Maybe there are rescues that have that right now. Um, it's planning ahead, so you wanna already have that list. I think every shelter should have a list of its area rescues that they can call on. Um, if you've set up a partnership ahead of time like we have, then it makes it a lot easier. They, they know what they're going to get, and you know what you need to send them, and so it can work really, really well. Um, be honest, one of the most frustrating things for rescues is, you know, I, I've got a golden retriever, and he's about two years old, and he's really healthy, and he only has one behavior problem, and he's digging. We get the dog, and he's seven years old, and he can barely get up the stairs, and sometimes you don't know. There are other times you do. And everybody, again, we're gonna, we want to do the same thing. We want to save the dogs, but be honest. It doesn't mean we're not going to come pull the dog, but it means I have to get a different foster care home for the dog that can't do stairs than the two-year-old who just digs in the yard. So um, be honest. It doesn't mean you are sentencing that dog to not be pulled by a rescue. It's just it allows the rescues to really make sure they have the right thing that that dog needs before it gets there. And it keeps your relationship. Um, after you can only be kind of, or feel deceived so many times before you just, I'm not gonna work with that shelter anymore. Um, another big one for, at least for us, is pull fees. Don't charge rescues to rescue your dogs. I mean, if you'd rather euthanize it than send it out to a rescue free of charge, you're not, you're in the wrong business. It goes back to compassionate leadership that they were talking about before. Um, we, we don't work with shelters that charge us full fees because I don't have to. Toledo doesn't charge us anything. That county shelter way up there doesn't. Now they have to charge a $25 spay neuter deposit. They pay for it themselves. They do that. I send them back the proof when it's done and they reimburse themselves. They have a little fund set aside because they don't want to charge the rescues. So our funds are short as well. Um, and then the AC, the animal control we work with, has actually a local vet that donates spay neuters to them so I don't have to worry about it. They don't charge us a fee either. So, Talk to your directors if there's any way to get the fee waived or some other program so you're not charging your rescues, you'll, you'll probably be able to partner with some really good rescues. Um, when you first start off the partnership, screen them. You're, you're interviewing them. You're not just going to hand an animal over to absolutely anybody who calls himself a rescue. Ask to see their contracts. Ask to see their applications. Ask, you know, do you vet check, home check, background check, do you do anything? What fee do you charge? If you're charging $500 a dog, I, I wouldn't work with you. I just wouldn't. It's not necessary. You can't run your rescue based solely on adoption fees. Otherwise, your fees are going to be about $500 a dog. Um, our fees are $75 a dog, and it's going to come completely vetted, microchip, spayed, neutered, and tested. Cats are $60. Um, kittens and puppies, six months and under, are 100 I think those are reasonable fees. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're reasonable fees because I expect them to have to spend additional money. They're going to have to go out and get supplies. Um, if they're a very responsible owner, they're going to take it to their own vet to make sure it's okay within that 30 days. Um, so I don't want them to spend all their money with me and then get home and be like, well, I would have got you toys and a bed and stuff, but I don't have any money left. Um, so 
try to keep the fees low if you're a rescue. Um, talk to your directors if they think it's a money thing. Find other ways to bring in funds, to fundraising events, group more volunteers to do events for you. Um, but try to try to keep the fees as low as you can um, within reason. But yeah, ask rescues, interview them, and vice versa. Let, interview your shelters. Where do your dogs come from? When they come in, what process do they go through? Do they get a 24-hour calm down time before they're temp tested? If you're a rescue that doesn't have behavior volunteers, you have no ability to temp test dogs, then you've got to partner with the shelter that's going to do it for you. If you don't have the resources to temp test and you're working with a shelter that doesn't temp test, I don't know how you're placing the dogs in foster care safely. And I mean, it's, it's a risk, it's a roll of the dice, but I strongly urge you, work with the shelters that do. There's a lot of them that do, and they'll send a temperament test right along with the dogs so you know what you're getting. Sometimes you can get it ahead of time so you know exactly what you're getting. Um, and jump in anytime. One thing I was just gonna say is that we just developed through the Humane Society did, um, and I'll put, I'll email this to either Courtney or to uh, the Michigan, for the website, but we have an application now for new rescues that they have to fill out before we will allow them to take our dogs. They're, it's just like adopters. We're going to screen them just like we are um, our rescues because we don't want to send these dogs just to anywhere just to say, oh, that one wasn't euthanized. It got out of here. It's living outside on a chain, but it wasn't euthanized. So we, I mean, I'll, I'll put it on our, the website, but we screen them just like we do our adopters. We want to make sure they're going to be in loving foster homes and then into a good home. We make sure that our rescue screen their adopters and their foster homes before putting an animal in their care. So as an example, if you're a shelter and you look at your euthanasia numbers, what are your top three reasons for euthanasia? Is it pregnant cats? Is it because of breed specific legislation and those breeds are coming in? Um, is it dogs with behavior problems? So look at those top reasons, what are those most common, and then look at rescues to help with specific ones. Mm -hmm. Pregnant cats, start recruiting fosters that can deal with pregnant cats. They know they're gonna have them at least eight weeks once the litter is born. They're out there, you just gotta find them, recruit those folks. So look at what your needs are, and that's what you're gonna choose to do. I, you know, I use the example of the <coughs> challenge with behavior problems, those people are actually out there to amaze me. But they're usually people who are educated in behavior training and they want to challenge they, or they need hours in their training. Work with those folks. Um, let them help you help these dogs. In shelter behavior programs, I, I can't say enough about it, I think they're phenomenal. Um, the Dog Friends League had one called Head Start and anybody who worked or volunteered in the shelter could recommend a dog for Head Start. And these were usually dogs that had either been there a long time, high energy dogs, very smart dogs, they needed a focus, they needed something to do. So every day, those behavior volunteers or trainers would go get them out of their kennel, work with them, teach them some things, keep their minds stimulated, and it, it made them more adaptable once they met with prospective, you know, and with applicants, prospective adopters. Um, it made them less anxious and cage crazy just because they had some more stimulation than normal. Um, those are great, and you can use volunteers for those as well. Um, so, with, from the rescue perspective, when you want to start a partnership with the shelter, you're going to define your intake criteria. Here's what we can handle. We only take <coughs> dogs, or we take dogs, cats, we take anything, we, can, we have the resources to help. Um, create an intake manual and give it to those shelters so that they know. Um, although we have our three shelters we pull from, we have in the history of Paws Lake pulled from just about every shelter. We'll call them Port Huron, uh, Roseville Police Department, Allen Park, they all call us and it, sometimes they hit us at the right time where, you know what, I do have a foster for that and not gonna take anything else anyway, so yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and pull that dog. Um, but having a clearly defined intake procedure of what you'll take, what you need it to come with, you gotta send me the dog with everything you've got. I mean, if, if the owner said, here's everything I know about the dog and it's past records, you gotta send that to me too. I want everything I can possibly get to help me make that dog uh, more adaptable, help me match it with the right home. Before I even get it to an adopting home, I gotta get it in foster care. And that is the same same process. I gotta match it. I can't just send anything to anywhere. People have kids, they've got other animals, and here's how long I'm gone. So again, it's it's a it's a matching. And the more information you can give us, the more time you can give us, the high the higher the chances are that we can help you or that we can pull from you. Um, your criteria for intake shouldn't be a secret. Everybody should know what it is. Um, and once you've identified shelters 
Another example, you don't have any transport volunteers. You just don't have any place. So you need to find a shelter within close proximity um, or a shelter that's going to help you with transport. So look at what you have, and that will really help you choose your shelter to pull from if, if that's the way that you do intake as a rescue. Um, so when we first approached shelters, we wrote down, we wrote a proposal. Here's what we want to do. We want to pull your time and space euthanasias, dogs, cats, any breed, at any age. That's what, what we want to do. Um, we send an email, follow up with a phone call. At some point, I want to sit down with the shelter manager, whoever is in charge of making these decisions, and let's talk about it. Got to communicate with each other. And I think the, really the hardest thing is getting over this whole competition thing. And I don't know why in Michigan, or if it's just because for so long it's been this way, but um, we don't work together as much as, as I see other states or other areas doing, and I, I don't, I, we should. We absolutely have to. Um, we've got to look past, well, I heard a story about, don't care, um, go off of your experience. Not everybody's going to do it right. There are always going to be some porters that call themselves rescues. Um, that's another thing we need to collaborate on. We need to know that amongst each other. And, there's no regulation. There's no board governing us. There's no anything. So it's up to us to self-regulate, to talk to each other, to be honest, and to educate each other. We can all continue to learn in the animal welfare field. No question. But I, Courtney's right. I mean, communication is key. Not only for, I mean, we tell them everything about the dog that they are getting, but we also help each other. I mean, there's times when Courtney or one of her volunteers will email me and say, hey, there's an adopter down south from you guys, can you check out the BSL law in this um, city? Or And we do it with Courtney all the time too. We have a lot of adopters in Michigan. So we'll email Courtney and say, do you know anything about this county? Are they breed specific? Are they, do they have pit bulls? What is their um, law on that? So just communication nonstop. We email each other probably 10 times a week at least. Yes. So. And, and, we, and we don't mind. It's, no, it's not critical. And so you got to I just get frustrated and annoyed with lots of questions. It's good. It's good. I remember, I remember when I was like eight years old and my four-year-old sister was vaccinating the car, a long car ride, and it was question after question after question after question. And I finally turned around and I was like, we stop asking questions. <laughs> oh, did I learn my lesson? <laughs> I was, don't ever tell her not to ask questions. Asking questions is good. Don't let it get to you and annoy you. Um, the more information, the better. Um, so again, just kind of how to do it, send an email, follow up a phone call, sit down and have a conversation. Um, ask to take a tour of the shelter, see how they do it, you know. Um, what do they do when an animal comes in? Does it immediately get vetted? Do they temp test it? How long before they temp test it? What do we do? You know, what is our protocol? Do we send out animals that are not spayed and neutered? I wouldn't work with that rescue, no way. Even if the animals that we're always getting are spayed and neutered, but we're adopting out others that aren't, that's not okay. Everybody's gotta be spayed and neutered before they go home. Um, I wouldn't work with a rescue that doesn't do that. I wouldn't work with a, sh shelters have a little more limitations. Um, but there are grants out there. If you don't know how to apply for grants, find volunteers who do. Volunteer Match is a great resource for people who, um, they wanna volunteer. A lot of them have professional backgrounds and know how to write or um, have some experience in grant writing. There are classes out there. If you've got a volunteer who says, I'd love to help you, but I haven't a clue how to write a grant, find, find the money or find a sponsor to send them to that class, and then from then on, they can help you with grant writing. Um, hopefully, you will stick around. If you agree to pay for their training, I always ask for a commitment. I, I need you to commit that you're staying for at least a year. I'm going to give you this training out of my pocket. I got to know you're going to be around that. Leave in two weeks to go help, you know, go help other people too. That's great, but you got to stick with me as well. Um, shelters too, they, if a shelter doesn't let you tour its clinic or um, its surgery room or the building in general, they have something to hide. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to work with that place. I wouldn't want to pull animals from there if they're hiding something. We, anything anybody asks us, we're more than happy to say, yeah, come look at our clinic or here is our euthanasia rates, here's our adaptable rates. Um, we have nothing to hide, and no shelter that is in this to help animals should have anything to hide, because you're in it for the wrong reasons. Um, covered most of this already, same kind of thing, but from the shelter perspective, um, what to look for, how to choose a rescue to partner with. Same, same kind of thing, what do you need, what do they have, and how can it be mutually beneficial? And you, you can't just constantly, every, you know, every Friday, okay, I, it, 
by the end of today, these 10 dogs are gonna die. Can you, can you help me? And it's every single, they will stop answering your call. Um, so give them a lot of time. Know who you're talking to and what they're able to do. Uh, there is a, um, I guess it's kind of a shelter, but they do a lot of exotics. Um, that is not our area of expertise. I don't know how many times I've told them that, they still call me and ask me. All this will get frustrating, and I continue to tell them, you know, here's what I know of where you can go for help with that, but um, go to them with things that you know that they can handle. Um, again, same kind of thing. How are their adoption fees? Do they do medical, um, what medical criteria do they do? You know, we, we test, we vaccinate, we spay neuter, we microchip when we can, um, but the, the basics have got to be there, and I think spay neuter, bar none, it's, it's critical, it's got to be done. Um, talk about the behavior evaluations, transport, transportation.